And you can use generative AI to accelerate drug discovery, predicting drug interaction, optimize molecular structures on your screen instead of at the bench and wait for days or months. They're already working on synthetic images that are actually created from histological images. This is a really important use case, particularly as we're talking about rare diseases. Bayer's using AI to automate 70 to 80% of their regulatory dossiers, which ultimately speed up the availability of medicines that are going to the patients. When I talk to people about AI, there's basically three categories. One, I'm bullish. One, you know, I don't care. And one, I kind of know it. it's useful, but I'll wait until somebody tells me to do something about it. I know which category you are in, uh, but I want to know why, why or when did you make that switch to, to be in that category as a bullish yeah, I think that, uh, so prior to joining Google, I had the opportunity to be in the healthcare industry, right? And so this was working in hospital systems, working in the pharmaceutical organizations. And I was on the receiving end of these different technologies. And I think part of when joining Google, right? Part of this is understanding here's where we can go right? And also then understanding what we are doing today and what, where can technology actually derive value today? So of course I'm going to be bullish, but I'm not going to say that this is going, you know, that tomorrow we are going to, you know, today we are going to be able to create a medicine from scratch just overnight, or we are going to diagnose no, you know, no humans in the loop. There, it's very important to look at this at a much, um, at a much, uh, uh, methodical way. And when you're looking at this in a methodical way, you can identify lower hanging fruit, your medium term goals and your longer term goals and how you can apply AI. So I'm bullish because I was on the receiving end of pitches. Here's your silver bullet. You know, it's going to solve everything. And I will not, I will not share names um, of organizations. Whereas in actuality, Harsh, it really is, here's the technology but we need to work together to build and apply these technologies, right? You know, create, when it comes to, to rare diseases, again, coming back to rare diseases, uh, you can accelerate drug discovery, right? Or you can accelerate research, uh, which we all know is like a costly endeavor, but, and you can use, you know, potentially generative AI to accelerate the processes because you can use that to accelerate uh, predicting tar drug interactions, right? You can optimize molecular structures on your screen instead of at the bench and wait for days or months. And so there's a lot of ways that generative AI has the ability to support the rare disease space, but we have to be methodical about it, right? This is not going to be something where we can look at the KPIs tomorrow. There are other things that gen AI can do for today, right? So I, I remain bullish because there are things that you can do today, empower patient communities. You can use AI to help you know, otherwise isolated patient groups to find relevant information or to find the right support, creating virtual communities or chat bots or offer, offering somewhat personalized guidance. That's something that can happen now and in a much, um, in a much uh, uh, efficient context than to say I can make my, you know, my medicine tomorrow. And so there are different gradations of the way you apply AI in a space. Yeah, I, I, I love, you know, two or three huge takeaways there, which is one, there has to be an approach, a methodical approach. And whether you take that from some external sources or standards like NIST or something else, or whether you define what that means for your organization. And then, right. you know, the second that you said, which is uh, having that vision, it's, you're not going to overnight come up with something that's going to change everything for you. Uh, but I wanted to dig deeper on this because you know, you've, you've told us that the potential is huge, especially for rare diseases to, you know, help with accelerating the research or improving the diagnosis. But for companies who are looking to take that step and start using AI, you also mentioned that it's easier to do it on your screen versus spend time in the lab, you know, trying to uh, do it the, the hard manual way. For companies that are looking to take that step, uh, do you have a three-step approach or or maybe what is the first step that you want them to take before they do anything else if they are in going in this direction? 
Yeah, I think one of the first steps, right, to take for anybody, doesn't matter what industry or what what's, you know, what part of the healthcare life science industry that you are a part of, it is really around first educating yourself. Um, I think there's a quote from Stephen Hawking that intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. And so when you look at generative AI, it's, you know, it isn't just another tool, it's actually something that can really change and transform the way you diagnose diseases and develop treatments. But in order to do that, right, this is not just those who are going to be your technical experts that need to understand. Part of how we're going to adapt and build trust in AI is going to be around uh, educating yourself and making sure that you understand its implications and keeping the human in the loop entirely, but also uh, educating everyone across the board, right? This is not just about making sure that it's just your technical experts who understand how the AI works, but if it is going to impact how we all work in the future, it's actually incumbent step one is that we need to have built, build an understanding across, right? Even in a layman's terms. And then two, being able to build trust into that system, right? Trust into that AI, that if you're putting a hundred things down in the funnel and it's recommending for you to look at these 10 molecules, why did that happen? And so I think part of it is education, building trust into the system um, before you even can get started. And, and, you know, as you are at Google, which is, you know, one of the most forward thinking technology organizations in the world with many others in that category. So I'm guessing when these types of conversations are going on, you probably have more real world examples or some experiments that you've tested within the company. Can you share any examples uh, that you've seen where generative AI had, has shown potential or has made a big difference either in research or patient care? Yeah, Harsh, I think there's two really good examples that I think are, are really fantastic to share for today. Uh, we, from a Google perspective, have a partnership with Ginkgo Bioworks. Ginkgo Bioworks, they're developing uh, pretty powerful large scale language models, which are, you know, the fundamental kind of building blocks of life, proteins and DNA. And these models actually open the door to a much wider range of possibilities. Uh, you could be designing your therapeutic proteins um, and, industri and, and even industrial enzymes. So you can to create some of the regulatory sequences that you need for gene therapy and, and, and other applications. So Ginkgo's vision is to empower the biotech ecosystem. So rather than developing the drugs themselves, they're actually looking at how do they make their models accessible, accessible, through, accessible to partners through APIs, through software packages, through different types of collaborative partnerships. And so by leveraging Google Cloud, Ginkgo is then training, refining, and deploying a lot of these sophisticated language models for a diverse range of tasks. And their goal is to use this generative AI to create comprehensive representations of proteins and DNA across a variety of different organisms um, and cell states, uh, which hopefully, right, is to lead to the development of a, a, a new versatile set of tools and have broader applications. So that's Ginkgo, right? When we're talking in yep. a much more biotech context, Another example that might be a little bit more tangible for some of your uh, some of the other audience members is our work that we do with Bayer. Bayer's mm -hmm. using AI to improve some of their drug discovery processes by analyzing different sets of data and automating a lot of tasks for insights and speed and you know to speed up some of their new medicines. So we work with Bayer across a wide variety of technologies with the ultimate goal to help them, you know, support from, you know, kind of from the de uh, developers, from idea to deployment and bring forward new AI enabled solutions or applications. Generative AI specifically has actually enabled Bayer to automate the population of 70 to 80% of their regulatory dossiers. So that yeah. actually is streamlining the regulatory process, uh, which ultimately you know, right. The goal is to then, uh, if you're able to move the paperwork faster and more efficiently with the same level of accuracy, you would like to speed up the availability of medicines that ultimately are going to the patients. Uh, also with far, uh, also with Bayer, um, I'll give you one other example is the use of synthetic data. 
Um, mm. In pharma, they're already working on synthetic images for oncology that are actually created from histological images. Um, and that's really important in the rare disease space because of the limited data that exists on training algorithms. So this is a, a really important uh, important use case, particularly as we're talking about rare diseases. Yeah, and uh, as you were talking about this, one of the examples that uh, came to my mind also on this topic was, again, this is just one of the projects that we've been working with a big pharma company and uh, we were having this internal meeting and they mentioned that there there is a potential maybe in the next three to five years somewhere where all the regulatory agencies are gonna maybe come together and decide a framework of how the regulatory submissions should be made because currently there is a mix of technology but there's a lot of human reviewers at fda and bunch of other regulatory agencies in the world but how can they decide what component of the submission should be in a machine readable format versus human readable? And then if they decide, hey, this is what the new rule is, how do companies, you know, they're going to be playing catch up to get that data in a machine ready state. Whereas right now it's still, nobody has made that decision. There are some companies who are thinking along those lines. Have you heard anything? I'm just curious. Yes, absolutely. I think that there are individual organizations that are looking at, um, you know, it's not just around the apl application of AI, but yep. there's also this angst, right, about how do we apply AI and how do we know the regulatory bodies will accept it? And then mm -hmm. there's many consortiums that uh, different pharmaceutical, biotech, medtech, medical device companies are creating in order to create some sort of standardization. And simultaneously, we have uh, we have uh, regulatory bodies like the FDA, who are then looking at how do you, how do they inform themselves on understanding the implications and the applications of these types of technologies because they know that uh, they need to inform themselves in order to create a point of view and guidance uh, guidance to the industry, and yeah. so. Um, the short answer is, you know, we as Google have the opportunity to support um, the education to some of these regulatory bodies. But ultimately, um, what I've been very pleased to see is regulatory bodies are not uh, necessarily creating a, you know, a wall of, hey, you know, no AI, this all has to be done the old way. I think it's really, uh, we've come a long way where everyone is trying to educate themselves and understand this because with the evolution of AI moving so quickly, I think that it's uh, it's it's really been incumbent upon upon both the industry as well as the regulatory bodies that have to provide the guidance. Both are trying to understand um, and create their points of view so that they can adopt these new ways of working at the same time, create the same level of safety and trust in these systems. Yeah, and absolutely for for us as a service provider and a consulting agency, you know, we are like the facilitator between the companies and the regulators on many of these projects. So it's extremely fascinating time to be working in, in life sciences and seeing all this going on and, you know, just sitting and thinking how, how it's all going to play out in the next five or right. 10 years. It's, it's going to be amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I want to, I want to go switch gears into uh, and go into rare diseases at the top of the episode, you mentioned that, you know, rare diseases are, uh, difficult, you know, it's tough to to crack exactly what's going on. Uh, we, you talked about, we've talked about AI and the potential there, but if we are to switch into the direction of rare diseases, what are some challenges that uh, make it hard to, you know, crack rare diseases? Yeah, you know, I started out, right? Part of it is around uh, data, amount of data, data access, right? There's by the very nature of rare diseases, it means that you have it, a disease affects a small number of individu individuals. So that makes research and development incredibly difficult. Think If you think about it, right, with limited patient populations, gathering enough even data, let's just talk about it in the context of clinical trial, it's a major hurdle. Yeah. Plus with the rarity, right, it's often you've got some vague symptoms, maybe lengthy diagnostic, you know, like it delays uh, 
of, you know, there's the emotional part that, uh, that um, certainly impacts patients and their caregivers and their families. And then to top it off, you've got all these complexities around the conditions, what they mean, what kind of treatments are available, making your decisions. So AI actually offers some hope here, I would say, because you can use technologies like generative AI to create some synthetic patient data to augment some of the limited real world information that we have. So it's like, it's just like expanding the research data with, you know, expanding the research pool without actually getting more patients. So AI algorithms can be trained, can be trained for faster diagnosis, for earlier interventions. Um, I've even seen some organizations who are looking, how can they repurpose some of their existing drugs? AI can actually sift through existing medications and identify some patterns that wouldn't otherwise be caught or picked up on for potential new uses in the context of rare diseases. So it's like, it's like finding a hidden treasure in a library of existing drugs. Uh, so when it comes to, I mean, I, I, you can see I'm getting really excited when it comes to the rare disease space because it is a huge, huge challenge. And the innovative application of a lot of these AI tech, um, of course, especially, you know, on platforms like Google Cloud, it really gives us a good, good opportunity to help and help a particular part of the industry that could benefit from the application of these technologies. And I think it's um, it's a testament to the power of how AI can really help this, uh, the healthcare and life science industry, and, you know, also provide additional, uh, additional hope to people who are living with um, rare conditions. Yeah. And and you you mentioned uh, one important point, which you know where where you said that AI is going to make it better by providing you know synthetic like learning about the data and then creating other data sets and you know maybe giving the researchers an angle or a question to pursue. We're not saying that AI is going to come out with the magic answer, but you know, AI is going to be able to process data much faster, maybe present new angles uh, or new areas to look at, or maybe, you know, st study different treatment plants, maybe combinations uh, of, of and outside of. So those are all for rare diseases. But have you do you know of any other areas outside of rare diseases where you think AI could also help? Yes, you know, I think that if we're going to pull away from the use of AI, right, or excuse me, the use of uh, AI, particularly in uh, rare diseases, uh, our conversation has been, of course, focused on rare diseases because of the scarcity of data, but really yep. you can apply this to the entire life science industry, right? Um, it is, you can use this in areas that are for research and being able to make sense of different data types to be able to have a more holistic understanding of an individual because harsh your you know if you have the same disease as i do are still you know our genetic makeups our environmental conditions our lifestyle everything is going to have a different you know we're going to have different outcomes but also there's also the use of uh, ai and generative ai in a more uh, what i would consider a lower hanging fruit opportunity when it comes to supporting the healthcare and life science industry to uh perhaps some automation of uh, high administrative burden opportunities, whether mm. that is in research to collate, um, you know, a variety of research types of research data, or what is, you know, what is the latest research on this and, you know, being able to sift through and contextually give you uh, information on scientific data. It could also be in a clinical trial context of using AI to help draft your first version of your clinical trial protocols. I have seen the application of uh, generative AI in life sciences to draft the first version of patents. Again, these are all with the human in the loop, right? This is not going to give you your patent from zero to 100. But the idea is now you could use your skilled employees not to draft that first version from scratch, but actually giving documents. Again, it could be any, any document, any part of your value chain in the life science industry that is heavy on um, paperwork and uh, documents, 
is an opportunity where you can apply generative AI to create your first version that then you can correct, improve upon, as opposed to starting from scratch. And we've seen um, the application of these types of, of, of this technology in, this, in these type of applications um, being used by life sciences more and more, and healthcare, um, but uh, more and more because uh, of just the um, shorter time to derive value Right. If you, you know, once you start leveraging this type of technology, now you're able to show time savings. You can show uh, the start and end of, you know, finalizing a protocol from zero from scratch or from zero to when it's fully ready to go. Uh, you, we are able to now um, work with organizations who are showing some statistically significant reduction in time or being able to reallocate their, you know, their employees, etc. So. Uh, there's a lot of applications outside of the rare disease space where you can see the uh, the usefulness of AI in life sciences. Yeah, I love the one about patents and you know uh, having that first draft and then a bunch of other examples that you share. I've also seen many others. Uh, and again, the common theme is you know it's not AI is not going to substitute the human effort, but it's only going to augment it. And the the human still has to do the critical thinking in this whole you know workflow and then use ai as like a technology to augment what they're doing absolutely so i know as as i mentioned on the at the start of the episode there are you know there's sort of like three camps of people in this whole ai side where uh obviously you know you mentioned you're passionate about it you you've shared so much and there's this area of people that are very hesitant to get in and some that are in the middle that are like, okay, I want to get in, but what about X? What about Y? Right? So, so to them, the X and Y is, you know, what about patient safety? What about the ethical and regulatory implications? What about bias? So what do you have to say to those people? Uh, and how are, how are you in your role making sure that you're balancing innovation with all these other concerns? So balancing innovation with patient safety and compliance is going to be absolutely crucial. It is critical. It is table stakes um, when it comes to AI in healthcare and in life sciences. So from a Google Cloud perspective, right? Customers retain complete control over their data. And in the in this in the uh, context of healthcare settings, in the context of healthcare, the in health in the, the use, the access and the use of patient data is protected through the implementation of clouds, Google Cloud's reliable infrastructure and our secure data, data storage that supports HIPAA compliance, along with each individual customer security, privacy controls, and processes. But specifically, right, in order to build that trust, right, I, I'm going to come back to, you, you know, we can say all of this, right, but there's also this added level of education where we are responsible for working with the industry and the industry then working with, with their technology providers on transparency and explainability. AI models, especially those that are going to be used in research or supporting any kind of triaging recommendations, they have to be trans transparent and explainable. And we have teams inside of Google whose entire focus is uh, working on, on transparency and explainability so that we can have a clarity on why an algorithm has arrived at its conclusions and how do we explain that to ensure fairness, um, accuracy, avoiding bias, We've got these robust validation and testing methodologies. We're extremely transparent about data collection and its use. And we are extremely um, committed to transparency and compliance with regulations like GDPR and some of the privacy best practices. But again, when you use AI, right, I'm always going to say, you're going to hear me say it every time and multiple times, it's always with human in the loop. AI is meant to augment and not replace. So keeping a human in the loop is going to ensure that critical decisions are made with both clinical expertise and the AI insights. So you can maintain accountability, but also the ethical oversight. I was um, speaking on a panel recently 
where the moderator had said, you know, you can use AI to provide whatever recommendations and whatever kind of triaging, but that last click of a button or that last decision point is what medicine is that clinician going to uh, going to write out for you? That is always still done on a you know on a pad, so to speak, with a with a signature from the doctor, right? Like that is one point that ultimately that you can provide whatever information, but that human in the loop is always going to be a key part. Um, and then I'll you know without going into um, a lot of depth for today's conversation, but you know, another part of thinking about the ethics and the transparency is continuously, continuous monitoring and improvement, right? AI models have to continue to be monitored, to be imp improved, to make sure they're effective and that they're unbiased. And all of this only happens when there's collaboration and engagement from the industry, right? This is the idea that we are the tech providers but we're only going to augment these things and we're only going to make them better with the right and appropriate collaborations with the industry who are going to help us not only apply the technology in the most appropriate way, but this is how we foster trust and address the right concerns to be able to actually augment the industry as a whole. So we wanna make sure that the AI actually meets the needs of all the stakeholders. So yeah, yeah. You, you made a really important point about, you know, monitoring and continuous improvement maybe that's not something you know in the traditional approaches which are more static where you complied with some requirements and you know it's working if it ain't broke don't fix it that kind of mindset but that's really doesn't work when you start bringing ai because it can process information so fast and you constantly have to make sure you're not deviating from your end goal so that is a huge challenge and I, I don't have the answer of how companies are going to monitor that and make sure it's it's heading in the right direction. But that's that's a really good point there. Yeah, I agree. So, so you talked about collaboration and, you know, making sure that we're keeping the patient at the center. So you have you you've had an amazing trajectory, you know, in healthcare and life sciences. You're currently at Google. You're doing amazing stuff. So what advice do you have for other leaders in healthcare and life sciences to maybe either start these conversations internally or maybe partner with other organizations just to see how we can collaborate together? Yeah, I think you really do need to foster that culture of innovation um, in your organization. I'll give you maybe um, a couple of a couple of thoughts and then maybe get a little bit tangible, right? So sure. We are in a very fast paced environment relative to life sciences and boards are asking their CEOs and, and, and executives um, do more with less faster, right? Yep. So balancing innovation and patient centricity is a, going to be a key part for any leader in life sciences. And it's, it's really a tough pull. And having been in these organizations before Google, right? Innovation can be sometimes looked at your as your extra project or your risky endeavor, right? And let's do what we know is tried and true. So creating a leaders need to, leaders are realizing that um, part of the future is going to be how they implement AI in their businesses, whether it's yep. on the left side in your R&D or in the right side, you know, across your value chain and commercial or all across. And you have to, in order to, you know, uh, it's no longer looked at as an extra project or, you know, here's your side project. It is now mm. leaders are, you know, it's incumbent upon leaders to understand how this is going to affect their company, their industry. And in order to understand that, it's not just you at the top, but you have to foster a culture where every decision is really revolving around how are we being most efficient? How can we, you know, if this might take a little bit longer to implement, but the long tail value is this, really thinking about this from not just, you know, how do I get from one budget cycle to the next? And of yep. course, everything is keeping patient outcomes in mind, but you know, you have to, that means empowering collaboration using data to drive decisions. Um, it's easy to say to encourage risk-taking, right? And risk-taking in the context of healthcare life sciences is never sounds, never sounds good, but Identifying the most controlled environments where you can apply AI, right? So where you are looking at the least amount of risk and start small and incremental. 
and continue to grow, right? And this is, of course, you're always keeping your ethics and regulations in mind, but identify projects that you can control wholeheartedly where you have, uh, where you can start to see the value and then continue to grow. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah, definitely. I'm I'm with you on, you know, start small uh, and then learn and scale, but don't wait to start, which is, uh, you know, I, I think every day with a new development in AI, I think it's, it's signaling to us that, you know, don't wait to start, start because the use cases are plenty, you know, for organizations exactly. to, yeah. So exactly. looking at the future of AI, uh, maybe five or 10 years ahead, what is it that's most exciting to you? Do you, do you, are you hoping to see something? Are you hoping to be surprised by something that's not yet out there, but anything that you want to share there? I will give you something that I, you know, even personally believe in. I think AI is going to be the big kind of way of democratizing. And in this case, democratizing access mm. to your healthcare information or to your quality of quality of care, democratizing, right? Breakthroughs for different diseases, right? It's no longer that you've got this rare disease, so therefore you're last in line for getting help. And so mm. when I'm thinking about what is, you know, how are we seeing AI supporting the healthcare and life science industry and how that's going to be, you know, five to 10 years from now, I'm looking at this as the great like equalizer in the sense that you are now really democratizing access to quality care, no matter what disease or what ailment you have. And that means, you know, having further reach for clinicians, right? It's no longer that you have to be within 90 minutes of a large healthcare system to be part of a clinical trial, right? Having many, many ways of getting access. You could be remote and underserved areas and still be part of a clinical trial, even if you're not 90 minutes from a large healthcare system. I think that we're going to see AI augment organizations who are trying to understand treatment pathways, and we're going to move away from being reactive to being yep. much more proactive. And I think that's really where I see um, AI is going to augment, right? If you can uncover patterns, then you can actually start doing predictions instead of trying to just cure what's happening, right? Um, yep. And being able to identify diseases before they actually manifest in a physical form. And we have to wait till it manifests till a physical form before we can identify them in many cases. So I think this is where you're going to see the application of AI in the next five 10 to 10 years really start to, to show how it's being measured and useful in the industry. But in the context of rare diseases, I know I really do think it's going to be transformative, right? Because you're going to be able to use synthetic data you're really going to be able to create those predictions without actually having to have a large amount of real patient data. And I think that has been historically what's hindered progress in the field. And so it's going to be um, really fascinating to see the progress that the industry is able to make with the application of various types of AI. Yep. I, I think, you know, for anybody that's listening or, or watching this episode, you know, there's a bunch of takeaways here that everything we've heard Shweta say today. The the first one that really stuck with me is that, uh, you know, there's always going to be a human component in whatever you're doing with AI. So don't have the fear that, you know, AI is here to replace humans, but try to educate, try to learn. And for if you're a leader, try to make sure that you're giving the training opportunities if you're an employee, maybe ask your employer to learn about AI and don't just wait because it is going to impact your role in some way and just try to learn how you can work with AI alongside AI. So that's one takeaway. The second one was because it's a new technology, it's going to need certain direction. It's going to need certain amount of observation and, and monitoring. And that's a that's a great point that we touched upon. So. If you are using AI, make sure how are you going to keep it on track? How are you going to let AI take you to your North Star if it's a patient or whatever you're trying to achieve? And then the third one uh, that you mentioned is don't wait to start. Look at opportunities. Look at things in your organization. Low-risk projects where you don't have to spend a lot of money. 
try to use it. If it breaks, try to learn from it and then slowly expand. So I think those are the three big ones for me here today. It is. Harsh, if I may, I'd love to add one more thing on, onto that um, list. And you yep. summarized it extremely well. But the other thing is, is we can't look at AI as something from the outside, right? Hmm. Oh, that's, you know, that's, that's something else, you know, I'm, you know, we're, we're this, you know, we're, we're this regulated industry and we need to be thinking about it like this. You know, when you, you think about, you want AI to be so ubiquitous in your work as you move forward, right? It shouldn't be something that's going to be a, an added burden or something extra. And again, right now, the industries are working together in order to get to that goal. But think about, um, you know, we've been so comfortable, we as you and myself and as consumers, we've been so comfortable with using AI to support recommendations. And it reduces the funnel for us. I'll give you a really good example. When you have, you, you use your favorite streaming service, right? And it recommends, you know, what stand-up comedy to watch next because it knows that you watched three stand-up comedies last time or that you maybe you like comedy films or something to that effect. You don't question that why isn't it showing me the thousand of other options? You're like, okay, great. I can look at these 15 that, are, that they're applying for. Or when you're writing a text message or an email and it auto-completes your sentence, you don't think, you know, twice about this. And so the idea is, being able to have this become so as a ubiquitous part of the way that we work, whether that is creating the first draft of your patent, or that is looking at your clinical trials, or being able to sift through a, a vast amount of information to, to get the information that you're looking for. Um, the next time you, you binge on you know, your favorite show on your favorite streaming service, I think you gotta you know, remember that potential that AI has um, you want that to be so ubiquitous in the way that you work. And it's not just going to be about the technology. It's also going to be about the people and the culture and the workflow in order to be able to embrace the, the you know, the full value and the application of technology. Yeah, 100%. And uh, listen, thank you so much. It's It's been amazing having you on here and learning about everything that you're doing in your role and all the exciting projects that you're working on. And sharing with us, you know, why you're passionate about AI, what do you see it doing in the life sciences field? For any of our listeners or viewers, if they want to connect with you after this episode or maybe, you know, learn more about you, do you want to share your social media uh, where they can get to you? Absolutely. You know, sharing, uh, connecting with me on LinkedIn is always the, uh, the, the best way to get connected with me. And then uh, we've got a lot of ways to connect with us in general, myself and others. Uh, through our cloud website on cloud.google.com. All right. That's it for today. Thank you, Shweta. Appreciate it. Thank you so much.